Welcome back to chapter 2 of the video series. In the first chapter, we learned a bit about the history and different types of solar cells. Now, we are moving towards the more technical part of this video series. In order to learn solar cells, there are three prerequisite knowledge that we need to know. These are semiconductor physics, PN junction diode, and photons. These will be covered in chapter 2, 3, and 4 of the video series. And before I start, I'd like to thank RS Grassroots Education for sponsoring this video. You can find written versions of my contents under the Design Spark website, links down in the description box. In these articles, I've put down links to further reference materials for your further reading. These reference materials are the ones that I previously used before while I was learning about solar cells, so rest assured that they are good ones. So now, there is nothing left to do than to sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. So, what are semiconductors? Now, we know our world consists of things that conduct electricity and things that don't. We call them conductors and insulators. If you look very closely at the atom of a conductor, say for example, copper, we can see that it consists of a nucleus of protons and neutrons, with electrons floating around it. These electrons are attracted to the core center of the copper atom by the positive nucleus. Now, for a conductor like copper, some of these electrons are so weakly bound to the nucleus that it very easily escapes from the atom. If we combine these atoms together, they essentially form an array of superhighways, transporting these electrons freely. This is why conductors conduct electricity. In insulators, the electrons are usually tightly bound to the nucleus and hence cannot conduct electricity. To visualize these properties quantitatively, we are often represented via something called the energy band diagram. Energy band diagram usually consists of two things, a conduction band with a higher energy level and a valence band with a lower energy level. The conduction band is the electron superhighway that we talked about earlier whereas the valence band consists of the electrons still bounded to the nucleus of the atom. In conductors, the conduction band is overlap with the valence band, which is why the electrons from the valence band can very easily transfer to the conduction band. In insulators, the energy distance of these two bands are very far apart, which means the chances of electrons hopping into the conduction band is very minimal. The energy band diagram of semiconductors is just right in the middle. Semiconductors are not really conductors, nor are they insulators. The distance between the conduction band and valence band, which we call the energy band gap, is not too high like in insulators, nor are the bands overlapping, like in conductors. With this special feature, it allows us to make the semiconductor conducting by just providing a little energy to push the electron from the valence band to the conduction band. In order to kick an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, the energy provided to the electron has to be higher than the energy band gap of the semiconductor. The energy band gap for a popular semiconductor like silicon is about 1.12 electron volts. Electron volts is the unit of energy commonly used to describe the energy of an electron. 1.12 electron volts is the amount of energy gained by an electron when its voltage is decreased by 1.12 volts. So, for silicon, the amount of energy provided to a single electron must be at least higher than 1.12 electron volts in order to move an electron up from the valence band to the conduction band. This moving up of electrons from the valence band to the conduction band is called excitation. After excitation, the electron can now move freely in the conduction band to conduct electricity. Now, if one electron is excited, then it will leave behind an empty space previously occupied by the electron. This empty space, or a lack of electron, is called hole. 
If this empty space is occupied by the adjacent electron, a new empty space forms, forming another new hole. This process can be repeated until we see a net movement of the holes. The hole is now freely moving in the valence band. So, with an excitation of electron, we created a freely moving electron in the conduction band and freely moving hole in the valence band. We call these free carriers. Free carriers is a very important terminology that semiconductor people use to describe freely moving electrons and holes. That's it for part one of chapter two. In this video, we learn how electrons and holes can be free carriers. In the following video, we are going to learn how we can manipulate semiconductors such that it can have more free electrons or more free holes. That's it for now. Take care and goodbye.